Finance Committee meeting to order at 4.54 p.m. Uh, apologize for being late. The uh, packet is not loading on my computer here for some reason, so um, we'll get started anyways. Um, I see there's one person um, remote, but what I'd like to do is just go around the room, introduce ourselves after everyone hears it, made an introduction, we'll uh, have the person remote introduce themselves. So I'll start, uh, Steve Koth, Alderman, Chairman of Property Finance, and then I'll go okay. starting off at my right. Tom Ryan, 4th District Alderman. Scott Kelly, Alderman. Dean Benjamin, Alderman. Finance. Joe Eichstead, City Engineer. Thad <clears throat> Kubishak, Finance Committee member. And would the one person that's uh, remote introduce themselves now? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Yeah, people in the square bar. Okay. All right. Um, I have number two. Uh, we're not taking any action on that tonight, but uh, since we have uh, some city staff here, I just want to have a limited discussion on it. Um, this was the consider and approve a license agreement with ERCO Worldwide to allow them to use city-owned rail track for storage of rail cars in the Rapids East Commerce Center. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the committee has gotten phone calls on this item. Have you, Scott? No. Dad? Okay, um, I've gotten some emails from residents in Grand Rapids and just we're going to hold, we're not taking action on it tonight, we're going to hold it over till August 7th, but just so, uh, since we have staff here so they're aware of it, I just want to ask Joe some questions here. Um, are these rail cars going to be loaded or empty? So my understanding is they will be loaded and so they've got, They've got a variety of product that they need temporary storage for. And so they're, they've, it is. Sorry, is that better? Okay. So yeah, ERCO does have a variety of uh, product, finished product that they, they will be storing in the rail cars that they need temporary storage for. Okay. Um, in, in the packet on this item, it just said the chemicals that would be stored there were approved by the fire department, but um, residents that are in Grand Rapids living in close proximity to these tracks have uh, concerns about what type of chemicals um, are going to be stored there and how potentially they ha how potentially hazardous they are if there was a leak. Sure. So, yeah, we were working with the fire department and provided, ERCO provided the safety data sheets which describe, you know, what the what the hazards are, um, and then we have requested from ERCO their emergency response plan. And from my understanding, they will be doing daily inspections of their rail cars to make sure that everything's secure and and safe. Um, but that's that's the extent of where we're at with it. Okay, in the. In the interim, if residents of Grand Rapids want to look at the SDS for the chemicals that are going to be stored out there, would they be able to do that by any means? Yeah, I would. I would think so. Okay. And um, security on those is there going to be regular type uh, security around these uh, chemicals that are proposed to be stored out there? Yeah, I guess I'm not familiar enough with the rail cars themselves to know um, what sort of locks and and different devices that they have on them to make sure that they, somebody can't tamper with them. But, um, you know, that's something that we could, we could check into. Okay. And if there was a spill, uh, would the liability be with the city since we're allowing storage of those containers on there or would the liability be with ERCO? I believe by, by the draft agreement so far that the liability would, would lie with ERCO. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have any questions for Joe Eichstead? No. All right. Um, and then again, we're not taking action on this tonight, so it, it'll come back on August 7th when ERCO comes forward with an agreement. So, 
Uh, next item is consider a special event application including street closure, noise variance, food bending, and alcohol license premise extension onto a public right of way, 2nd Street South between East Grand Avenue and Birch Street, including the sidewalk on the east side of 140 East Grand Avenue building from BCA Enterprises, LLC, Coriel Abbott agent doing business as Beast Half House located at 140 East Grand Avenue for a second annual Never Forgotten Honor Flight Street Dance to be held on Friday, September 11th from 3 p.m. to 12 a.m. midnight. Um, I guess I'll go right to you, Brandon. Do you want to walk up to the podium and turn the mic on? The tap house, which we'll also have at that point, the brewery incorporated, incorporated with it, we are asking permission to close off the street again, exact same as last year to do the fundraiser. Our goal still is to raise $70,000 to give to the Never, Never Forgotten Honor Flight based out of Wausau, Wisconsin at one time. Um, this will continue our fundraising for that. Um, once again, we'll have the street closed off uh, and it will extend our premise to the street. I've contacted all of our neighbors and businesses around and um, they have no objections as far as I have heard. Um, the plan is to not do a, a beer trailer this year. We'll serve everything from inside of the building itself, just allowing them to go outside for the band. Um, midnight is way past what will be. The band is playing from 7 till 10, and at 10 o'clock the band will be shut down, and then we'll just tear down so the street will be open again for the next morning, as we did last year. Um, as far as security goes, um, we'll have our own private security as we did last year, so there won't be any necessity to have any extra law enforcement uh, costs at that time. Um, and I've spoke with Chief Blevins, and he's okay with continuing what we did last year for that as well. So, so you went on the committee. Have any questions for Brandon? Go ahead, Thad. Brandon, <clears throat> um, I love the idea of a fundraiser, especially for this. Can you explain further uh, how you're keeping your books separate? Is this 100 uh, percent gross receipts going to this fundraiser? How is this? Just so that there is a differentiation, because with this situation, we've had a premises extension requests recently, and some of them, or I shouldn't say some of them, but there may or may not have been situations where it was like a private party and individual profit generation, which is, is not a deal breaker, but this is specifically a fundraiser that is not being done by a 501c uh, nonprofit organization. It's being done by a business. So how, it, and, and not, you know, without going into great detail, I mean, I, you know, if you got to keep a separate book, but how are you doing that? Is this 100% going to the honor flight then? Correct. We, we've continued to um, grow our money base, and we've raised uh, approximately seven to ten thousand um, dollars. My wife does all of the accounting portion stuff, as she is an accountant, so she has separate books on all of that. Um, the Never Forgotten Honor Flight is—they are included with us on this event, um, which allows us to use their raffle numbers. So, if we want to do raffles and such like that, uh, we've done probably half a dozen events with them so far. Um, so in short, to answer your question, yes, it's specifically for that in all of our book shows that the, the, we don't charge admission in. Um, we ask for donations, and if, if people want to, they give it to us. All donations go for there. All of the raffles and such go towards it. And we have separate books from beer sales from that night and such, yes. Anything else to add? Does anyone else have any questions for Brandon? No. Ray? Tom? No. Nope. All right. Um, hearing no further questions, I'll make a motion to approve the special event application, including street closer, noise variance, food vending, and alcohol license. Premise extension on the public right of way, as described for Friday, September 11th. 2020 from 3 p.m. to 12 a.m. midnight. 
I'll second it. We have motion and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Steve, we skipped number three. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> Sorry about that, Paul. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Um, we're going to backtrack item number three, which I overlooked, which is uh, review and consider proposals to replace a snowplow wing on two single axle patrol trucks. Paul? Thank you. Uh, back in July of 2019, I came to this committee uh, to request to replace the wings on two 2006 pickup or a one ton, sorry, single axle trucks. Um, we feel that the trucks were mechanically inclined and, and in good enough shape that we can continue to run them, but some of the equipment was starting to wear. Um, at that time, uh, Monroe truck equipment was the low bidder, and it was approved by this committee to, for us to purchase the wings from Monroe truck. A purchase order was sent to them. Um, I guess the moral of the story is, is they failed to, to uh, complete the purchase order. Um, the original request or the original proposal was that they were going to supply it within 180 days which would have gotten us to the end of January. Um, I reached out to them in February. They said it was going to be another two weeks. Two weeks went, reached out again and just cut, kept getting the story of two weeks, two weeks, two weeks or whatever. At that time I reached out to um, Stainless and Repair which was the um, second vendor to see uh, you know, without really knowing what was going to happen with Monroe Truck here, reached out to Stainless and Repair, and they said that they'd be willing to honor their pr proposal price from um, from that June time period of 2019. Um, I asked them if there was any issues with steel or anything like that, to, you know, just to try to see if there was some sort of issue, why why we weren't getting our product that that was supposed to be here, and they said no. They would they would at that time in in uh, February of of this year, they would have been able to supply us the wings in 60 days. Um, we have had some other issues with Monroe truck um, on some other one ton trucks and things like that. And uh, I guess my biggest concern is, is that these are trucks that are, um, that pretty much maintain our streets in the winter time. And if we had some sort of catastrophic, catastrophic failure, what is what's going to happen? You know, we, we can't afford to wait six months, you know, to to get a, a replacement or whatever. Um, I don't like having multiple brands of equipment in our shop because it's easier for our shop to maintain, you know, like things instead of multiple different companies. Um, and so we do have we do have the the product that Stainless and Repair is going to supply us is a Hanky plow and wing. We do have two of those on our big loaders. I've reached out to Wood County Highway, who also uses Hanky Wings and Monroe Wings, and they feel that the Hanky Wing is actually a better product than Monroe's. Um, but we do have somebody within five miles of our shop that we can borrow parts from if we need to. Um, and so my request of this committee is is to um, allow us to purchase the the wing from Stainless and Repair. Um, <coughs> The total price for two of those wings is $27,700, which is an additional $3,206 from the original um, approved amount last year in, in June of 2019, or July of 2019. So you want to have any questions for Paul? No. Uh, hearing no questions, I will make a motion to approve the uh, purchase of the truck wing from the second bidder um, for an amount not to exceed $27,700. I'll second it. We have a motion and second. Is there any other further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. Item number five is consider a temporary Class B beer and Class B wine license for the Assumption Athletic Association located at 445 Chestnut Street for a Royal Golf Scramble to be held on Friday, August 7th, 2020 
from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, they had their application, and this is something that they have done before. Does anyone on the committee have any questions or comments about this? Hearing none, I will make a motion to approve the license for Assumption Athletic Association located at 445 Chestnut Street uh, for the event on August 7, 2020 from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. I'll second. I think Scott got that second. <laughs> um, any further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Item number six is the beverage operator licenses. Um, got those. There were none recommended, denied by the police chief or any other problems. So I will make a motion to approve the beverage operator licenses as presented. Let's that's a second, Scott? Yeah, I'll second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Item number seven is consider a request from Alderperson Coth to suspend the city's open container ordinance on Thursdays through Saturdays from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. from July 2nd, 2020 through September 5th. Um, to allow public outside of bars and restaurants to socially distance. This would be limited to beer and wine only, no hard liquor, and plastic or aluminum containers only. Uh, on the 24th of June, we had a um, pretty lengthy discussion about it, and it, uh, I think out of that we had some ideas, so I'll just open it up and see if anyone off, uh, from the committee wants to talk about that. Dad? Um, where I'm at with it is, uh, in speaking with the chief of police, I don't want to create an undue burden on the police department and make their job harder for them. Um, and also talking with uh, some other city staff that these premise extensions would have to be typed um, for legal description. And I don't want to overload in any individual departments of the city, but um, COVID-19 is here and it is among us. And I don't know if anybody else here is aware, but as of July 1st, Dean County has shut down their bars for indoor service. Uh, bars are restricted to patio service only, and restaurants now in that area have to operate at 25% capacity. I know it's easy to think, well, that's Madison. It's an hour and a half, two hours down the road, but I think that's something we need to think about is that it's an hour and a half, two hours down the road, and you have people that come up here because we're further north and we got camping and other recreational activities. So the last thing I want to do is overcrowd our bars and other recreational establishments and create a situation where we can have this start spreading in the community. Um, I want to give something to the bars that will enable their clientele to go outside so they're not in one spot um, but trying to be reasonable and balanced about this so it's not a kind of a out of control situation go ahead scott i personally don't have any um, concern with the with your logic um, but let's say I have I'm a I have a business a restaurant or a bar. What are the guidelines around which I should be able to determine that the individuals may leave my establishment and stay within a certain area? Um, what are those guidelines so I would be able to make those plans? That's the question I had that last time we met. It's just um, if I don't know <laughs> what those guidelines are that are going to be established, then how do I, let's say there's two, two establishments together, do they make one large area or two separate areas? Um, do you encroach into the street? How far? Do you have to have... Um, 
uh, um, uh, borders around there? Um, can I encroach and go into a public parking area? So, I mean, those are the area, those are the questions, and I won't be able to make those, as an establishment, I won't be able to make those decisions, so I don't know what the guidelines would be. Um, that's, <laughs> that's a concern I have. In, in working back and forth on this, um, and getting some further communication, Sue, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if someone does a premises extension, they would have to have that description. They would have to go do that through the clerk's office, and then that description would have to read that their premise extension would be out the door, and then to the area that they're going. If it enclosed a portion of their sidewalk, parking lot, or wherever they're going with it, and that area would have to be controlled by uh, being fenced off or marked off um, to whatever they're deciding to have that area to be. Um, to my understanding, the control measure on that would be is if they're going to go outside and have their drink, it would have to be served either in an aluminum can or plastic cup. And then once they leave the building, the inside of the bar with that beverage, they cannot come back inside the bar with that same container. They would have to discard the one they have or finish the drink and then go back in and get a different container. Um, in this, as Sue le mentioned last month, we, we had the two options. We can either do the premises extension, which would, to my understanding, include what I just described, or we can do a portion of downtown where we suspend the open intoxicant where if somebody got their beer, they could walk out and walk across the street to the park. And I know um, that might create an undue burden on the police department. And which is not something I had an intention of, of creating. So the only other problem I see is not every bar downtown has a parking lot that they can go into or a large space. So in my initial thinking, I was trying to do something that would be fair for, for every establishment. Um, this didn't seem like that was going to work. So kind of where I'm at is if we figure out a way to do this, it would just be better to have the uh, uh, bartenders that want to do it, uh, do it, or the bar owners that want to do it, do it on a premises extension case by case. And uh, I'm assuming they'll put containers out there for refuse, you know, for plastic cups and so forth, and they're responsible. And if they don't, then do we fine them or charge them or just tap on the shoulder and say, next time, make sure you pick it all up. Because you might have quite a few establishments downtown. I could see maybe in other locations where an establishment's by itself, and it'd be easier to pick up and so forth around. But um, are we going to, how are we going to do that? Are we going to put city containers out there? Are they going to put their own containers out there? Are we? So that's a question I have, too. That's that's a question I don't have an answer to, but um, I did see in the writing on this that these premises. Sue, did you have something? Well, each applicant would need to provide a plan in terms of where they want to extend their premises, and and um, so let's say someone wants the sidewalk in front of their in their uh, in front of their establishment then we would want to know okay is there going to be seating out there you know you don't want to obstruct the sidewalk necessarily i mean still allow people to get around it um uh wh whether they're serving food or not um, whether they're going to have refuse containers um hours of operation maybe we make them if, if it's on public property we might say that you have to close down at you know 8 p.m. or something like that. So the, the, the areas that are pu at the public property, if they want to extend on public property, we have a little more control over those types of areas. So those are, that's why each one is going to be kind of in a case-by-case -case basis, depending on 
what area they're requesting and whether it's private or not. Um, in terms of someone that's violating, well, then we just revoke the city clerk just as easy, easily as she can uh, grant the license or the extended premises. She will revoke that if there's any issues. Um, and I would assume that that might be a strike against them in terms of their the renewals or uh, their ability to extend their premises in the future. Um, if they do extend their premises, I'm, I'm not sure if I got it right, Steve, of what you had said, but if they do extend their premises, then they can come and go uh, with alcohol in and out of their establishment. If we simply go to a suspension of open container concept, then once they're outside the bar and get into the open container area, then someone can't yeah. come back in. So they really are have to assert or, or they're really gaining control over an area and, and they need to treat it like it's their licensed premises, they're responsible for what happens there, you know, no minors, it's just like extending their, their bar or restaurant, so. Any more questions? Yeah, I would prefer if it's just the extension of the, of the premises. Rather, I don't want to, just the concern that the chief had with regard to people moving around with liquor outside of that area. So that's a concern I have. Yeah, go ahead. Ms. City Attorney, um, for a little bit of clarification, I'm looking at your ordinance here, and I think we could, we have the ability to change it or at least uh, amend it for the full city council. But uh, it, that was one interesting thing that you brought up about maybe this might affect future renewals of full licenses. Um, is that language written in there, or is that language you know advertised uh, that if if this was a case where they applied for a, a, a premises extension? and somehow it's tied to a potential renewal of a full license, is that gonna cause, kind of like what we had talked about in a previous uh, uh, committee meeting about, is this now a new property that uh, a, an establishment would have if we tie it to future renewals? If we didn't tie it to future renewals and we just revoke the license and the re revocation of this did not affect the future renewal in, in next July 1st, then I would think that there is a clear cut uh, difference between these, but if we tie them together, are we kind of opening up Pandora's box? I don't believe so because I, right now in renewals, it basically says that, um, or, or even an initial license, that you have to look at violations of not only our ordinances, which would be chapter 23 and 24, I believe, 23 and 24, and 125 of the state statutes, that those, that those could possibly be used against you in terms of a renewal or a new license. So. Uh, you know, I guess violating our Chapter 23, uh, no matter what the premises subscription is, is going to be, you know, considered. Uh, and I don't think that that, op that it, you know, just because it, on that day, your premises subscription was, happened to be in increased or expanded, that that really would be an issue. You're still violating the alcohol and uh, liquor laws of the state or the, of the city. And that could be considered. I'm not. I'm not. It's not one of. It's not necessarily a violation that is, um, you know, disqualifying. And, and there are, you know, as you know, there are certain violations that are more serious than others. I, I don't think this would necessarily be considered a, a serious one. But it, it's just, you know, one one more or one uh, one thing to look at when we're looking at renewals and and uh, initial applications in terms of the history of any alcohol violations. Would you uh, maybe look into that just in case? It, because I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to the, what the language is on the agenda as far as opening up uh, and, and suspending the open container. Because I mean, you could have an open container anywhere. You could go to the gas station. If you bought a 24 ounce, you could crack it in the parking lot. As long as you're not behind the wheel, you can slam it and then drive off. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's the Wild West doing that way, and how do you patrol that? But as far as the premises extension goes with this, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not really a proponent for it. But on the other hand, I'm also someone that's open-minded that, I mean, hey, if it, if it works, 
and, and it works for everybody, that's cool. So I, I, I'm not opposed to trying something new, um, but I think that uh, with that, I just would hesitate, I, you know, like for taking a second view on that, if we were, when we reconsider uh, liquor license, uh, full liquor licenses next year, next summer, uh, that I, I would not like to add if there was a revocation here. I mean, it just, it, that one failed. And then now if there was a second issuance of this next year of a premises extension, then maybe we would take that into consideration if there was a revocation in there. But I think it's, it's, it's one of those where if we actually do do this, we need to make it known right off the bat that this license is not gospel from the clerk's office. If, if something happens, and these are the rules and these are the guidelines. Uh, I don't care how minor the violation is, if something happens, that's gonna get revoked and you, you can't do it again. So um, I guess that's where I stand on this. Thanks, Dad. Uh, Mayor Blazer. Sue, so would, it, would it be easier if we just designated or is it a potential possibility to designate a boundary by streets downtown and suspend the open container like we do at events? Is that an option? And my other concern, sorry, is that I think 11 o'clock is getting kind of late. You know, if we did it in the evening, so if you wanted to go sit down by the river and have a drink at 8 o'clock, but I think once you start getting into later, then it might turn more into a party. But I guess my only question was if, uh, if we could look at it, if that's an option to suspend open containers within a certain street boundary or how would that look? Thanks. Right, we could do that. That's what uh, Stevens Point is doing in their square area. They have it delineated. You know, I, I did have a map at one point. I'm not sure if I brought it with me. Um, yeah, that's possible. I mean, you, you, you run into issues though there with, um, okay, so that means that it's just beer then. There's no intoxicating liquor or, or wine. And it, that means that once you leave a bar, you can't go back into that bar, or you can't go back into another bar with what you have. And you've also opened it up to open contain, like people are bringing their own downtown. So, I mean, it's just kind of how you, <laughs> how you want it, whether you want to kind of control the establishments and, and, and then have them have their control of certain premises, or whether it's just kind of all open and then they lose Obviously, you lose something there, but it, you know, it's probably, you know, I, I agree if it's more contained, like in a certain area versus the whole city, it, I'm sure Chief Blevins would agree with that. And then I don't know what, you know, what that area might look like, but then you might be letting, you know, then there are other bars and restaurants outside of downtown that then are not, you know, able to, to, you know, gain any anything from it necessarily, but yeah, that, that's certainly an option. Right, there might be instances where, um, I mean, I guess you could suspend the open container in onto, well, that would be their property. There, I mean, technically, let's say this is my, um, this is my bar, and then outside of my bar, I have uh, an overhang, that is not inside the building, it's outside. And, but that isn't part of my premises right now. Well, for me, and then let's say the sidewalk is, has a suspended open container. For me to, to get, take, a bar, take a drink out of this bar, an open container, and then when I, as soon as I get onto my landing here, I'm on private property that isn't licensed, and I have an open container, and so how am I, then getting to the area where the suspended, where the where the container is suspended, I mean, it, so you might have some instances where some people might need to expand their license premises to get to an area where you're suspending the open container. I, it's just, I mean, there, you know, depending if you were right on, have a storefront right on the street, depending if you're set back, depending if you're, you I know, think of like it, Andy's, it really depends. Andy's, they've got that walkway up to the yeah. floor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, because, yeah. Yeah, the sidewalk to the to the front door would n be private property and not, right, and they're not licensed under the premise and mm -hmm. not covered by open container because it's private property. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yeah, for downtown on tap, we kind of extended everyone at least out into the sidewalk and then people, you know, you might have people that are just standing outside, they can kind of come back in, but then once you're off, off that area, you're not supposed to come back in or go into anybody else's bar, which I know that it's impossible to, <laughs> to police that, but. Anything else? So it's really just how, you know, how you want to do it and we can, you know, work further on once we kind of know what you, what you want to do and. I guess I personally think it would be maybe easier on the clerk's office because they're not extending all the premises and redoing all that. If you just suspended the ordinance in a certain geographical area defined by streets and then yeah, I personally, and, and that's, you know, what the community decides is that I think 11 p.m. is getting a little late. You know, I think if you did it earlier in the evening, but it, it'd give that opportunity for people to walk downtown and sit by the river. Thank you. Chief, do you have anything to say on that part? <laughs> so I, I am in favor of allowing the alcohol establishments and the bars in town to have uh, outdoor seating or, or areas outside where people can drink. I. I, I, I really can't support a geographic area or then we're just going to create kind of a French Quarter situation downtown, which I think would be kind of hard to police. Um, anything that you do pass, I'd request that there are some very clear uh, lines so that it's not left out to interpretation by the officers at 10 o'clock at night. Well, what's, what's open and what's not and where can people be? Uh, so it does, I think, need to be pretty clearly laid out. Um, but again, I do, I do like the outdoor seating for people. I think people enjoy that. I enjoy it. Um, and so I'm not against that. I'm just really a little leery about the free-for-all that could occur with a geographic area being open to open alcohol. So just my thoughts. Thank you, Chief. Thanks. Um, I see we have a bar owner here from Lucky's. Lee, would you like to come on up and... Yeah. Um. I'm happy that we're, we're, we're trying to be proactive on stopping this virus. And again, it's like what Steve says, now that we're gonna get more and more people from down south coming up, it's the younger people that are doing whatever they wanna do. Like always, you know, we're talking people, you know, 21 to 40 years old coming up from Milwaukee and Madison, stuff like this. I just want to have a little more distance in the bars and stuff like this. I, even if we run half capacity, it's in and out or whatever. And I know it's a, it's, a, it's a tough balancing act that you guys need to come up with. And I hate to say this, we talked to the chief, we talked to Brandon and stuff like this. The outside seating is, is a good idea. Just to get people outside, I hate to say this, to me it wor would work better if the whole downtown, because none of us really have outdoor seating, we would have to block off some parking spots to have. It's really be nice if we had a park. We have a really nice park right in downtown that it'd really be nice if people enjoy that with a beverage. And I know that it could be carried away or whatever like this. There's no good black and white solution to this problem. I, you can, guys can bounce this all over and it's like, yeah, there's gonna be people that are gonna take advantage of it, but we could maybe save a couple people's lives because this whole virus doesn't make sense to anybody how you can have a thousand people in the room and it's only gonna kill one of you. It's just the one that dies or gets sick, we gotta protect somehow. So I know that, that Lucky's, we'd like to get people outside to go outside and walk around. But again, is it's really be nice to be able to walk from Lucky's to Whiskey to Jennings to Stools, because once you come down downtown, you hang around downtown. If you want to go out and socialize and enjoy the outside, 
we'd like to have you go out and enjoy the outside somehow with your drink. It expands our bars. Uh, you know, and I'm worried about the garbage and stuff like this. Yeah, we need to, even now, we need to do a better job of picking up our garbage. Being downtown, I go around on, on Saturday afternoon and Sunday and go pick up all the garbage from everybody else. We need more receptacles for sure, but there are people that sometimes don't use the best judgment at night. But again, is you see all kinds of cans along the road all the time. These are the same people. So you guys have a tough, tough decision to make. We're just asking for a little more space. For you guys to come up with something is tough on you guys. I don't have any good, good answers for you guys, just that I appreciate Steve looking at this and seeing that there is a problem. We don't want to become Madison. That's all I can say. Because if we close the bars one more time, I know that I can't do it again. The loss and no help that we're getting from the government on small businesses is just devastating. So thank you. That's all I have. If anybody's got any questions out of me, I'm more than willing to ask, you know, answer. But that's my two cents. That's all. Lee, I talked to you a couple months ago. And if you don't mind sharing this information, um, when you just referenced the last shutdown and how much it hurt you, you said you missed um, nine deposits. How much did that total that your business lost? We, <laughs> it was pretty tough to say how much the de deposit it's lost, but my fixed cost between the two bars, and that, that doesn't include Lucky's, that was, was supposed to launch that weekend of St. Patrick's Day. I lost 18, that cost me $18,000 just to be closed. That was between the rent that we pay on one building, the property taxes, the insurance, the pro rate of the liquor license, and all the other fees that we have, the, the, the cable, the, the, everything together, that was that number. I mean, that was fixed costs that we could not get out of. And so far, all we had is both bars, truly both Door and Venus, did get the $1,500 city grants, and I, we appreciate that more than anything. We applied for one $2,500 grant through the state of Wisconsin that we don't know if we're going to get or not. But again, is I know that I'm a little older. I made good choices in my life, and I know that it didn't affect me as much as a lot of the other small businesses that are truly devastated. And I don't know if they can recoup or not. We cannot go through another closing like this. <laughs> so that's all I can say. I can't say how much I've lost income, but I know that I lost. That was how much it cost me to be closed. Does anyone else have any questions for, for Lee? Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Lee. Sure. I have a comment, though. Go ahead. Um, I, I still like to keep um, an extension of the premises. Um, therefore, the bar or restaurant has a responsibility and needs to control it and monitor it. It's a baby step. I agree that maybe an area eventually, let's try this first, eventually open up, um, like the whole downtown, the park, et cetera. But I think we're taking stages, um, and my preference would be establishing an extension and, and a parameter. The other thing I, I just wanted to comment, and the time at 11 o'clock came up, and was mentioned 8 o'clock possibly. Um, what does, this sounds stupid maybe when I say it, what does 11 o'clock mean? Does that mean the last amount of liquor that can leave the premises? or those people in that area need to leave that area. Um, if it's the last amount of liquor that can leave the premises, should that maybe be 10 o'clock and not 11 o'clock? Or should that be 9 o'clock and it was mentioned 8 o'clock? So what, are we, what would we be considering the last amount of liquor that could be 
leave and be in that area. Um, my thinking would be 10 o'clock. So someone drank it and people could start cleaning up and then at 11 o'clock it's clear. So something to think about the time because that's come up several times now. So. And Sue, correct me if I'm wrong, but when it, when you get to the expiring time on a premise extension, like if the premise extension expired at 11 o'clock, it means at 11 o'clock there can be no more alcohol in that designated area that, that it goes back to what it was before it started? Well, it, right, I guess it depends what the area is. Uh, for instance, if it's in the downtown area and maybe you're on a, in the parking lot or a sidewalk, if the intent is, well, normally people aren't outside that late at night, so at 10 o'clock, everyone needs to go inside. I mean, you're, you're no longer going to have people in that area. Or you could have it that the alcohol stops in that area at 10 o'clock, but they can continue to be there till they close their premises. Um, obviously, those bars that already have some outdoor patio areas, they're going to, they're, that's part of their premises right now, and, and that can be open till bar time, yeah, or people can be outside those areas until bar time, and alcohol can be out there till bar time. So it, it really depends how, you know, what, what you want. If, if the idea is to um, have, you know, have people not be outside after a certain time, then we can simply say that the extension of the premises on, uh, you know, at, at 10 o'clock, it, it ends and people need to go inside. Or if it's the, just the alcohol, I mean, it can really be whatever you want, and that might be different depending on the location and 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 such, and whether there's, you know, is it a restaurant or not, or um, so. Yeah, that can be whatever you want it to be in terms of weather, the the time, and and what that means in terms of, uh, you know, people being there or not drinking alcohol or. So then I'm thinking maybe if it's 10 o'clock that you you can't take liquor out in that area and, and you leave the area by 11 o'clock or clean up that area by 11 because um, of, of the residents in that area and, and so forth. And um, if somebody's intoxicated and all that other stuff could lead to problems as you get later in the night. So it's just something to think about how we want to deal with that. Tom, did you have anything? Um, I actually, so at 11, say it's 11 o'clock, so then does everybody go back inside then? <laughs> I mean, are we dealing with non-social distancing at, after, at 11 o'clock? <laughs> Just out of curiosity. Well, right, I guess that would be up to the, the, the bar owner if they're you know, or the, just the knowledge of the people of this air, open area is outside. People that are going outside maybe want to take advantage of that. And knowing that it closes at 10, they might want to not go back into the bar. And, but yeah, it, that's true. I mean, it, if, it, if you're saying it closes, then, you know, you, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay, <laughs> can't stay here or whatever, however that goes. That you... <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, I think that we've spent an inordinate amount of time on this tonight as well as the previous meeting. In the past, whenever an organization or an act, active group or anybody has come forward, uh, I think with the committees that I've had, we've challenged them to come up with the plan themselves and we would either vote it up or down. We're a legislative body, we're not uh, an administrative body. So Tavern League's got a wonderful uh, organization. I think that if the taverns want to create something, Put a plan together, bring it in front of us, we'll vote it up or down, we'll make amendments to it, but this body should not be hashing out every single thing with this. We, we need to be provided with a plan, and uh, because ultimately at the end of the day, whatever decision we're going to make, because we're the ones creating this, there's going to be some tavern owners that are going to dislike this because they weren't involved. So as far as I'm concerned, we're a body that votes up or down. So it, it, we need to move on with this. I think it's a great idea <laughs> that this should be postponed and maybe the Tavern League can come up with a proposal for our Common Council in two weeks. 
Well, the thing of it, the thing of it is, is if we postpone this, I mean, I understand what Alderperson person Kubishek just said, um, that we're not an administrative body, but we got to start somewhere. And what this, because of the circumstances of what's going on, this is a place to start with the premise extensions. And the questions that we asked tonight about where the boundaries are going to be and how we're going to get somebody onto a premise extension, onto a sidewalk, that would be the, the tavern owner's responsibility when they come and apply for that premises extension, that they're going to say, the, my doorway, which is not in the original um, liquor license, I'm going to use my doorway onto the sidewalk, and then I'm going to have it marked off to this area. That's, that's the administrative part of it that gets, that gets somebody outside. And Sue, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but then once that premise extension is granted, that then becomes the tavern owner's responsibility to mark that area off for their patrons, correct? So we're, we're not doing the administrative work of saying where they're going to go. With, it's already being done when that tavern owner asks for that extension. And then in here, like it's also been said, is if there starts to be problems with it, like in the morning you see a mountain of plastic cups in front of one one business and it's constantly not getting cleaned up or the cops are there um, every other hour for problems that uh, we would have the power to, or in this case the city clerk would have the power to revoke that premises extension um, just so we're not postponing this. Um, I would make a motion to uh, accept the recommendation of the city attorney to give the general provision for a premises extension for taverns to apply for a premise extension on Mondays through Saturdays uh, from the hours of three. I'm just putting some hours in here with this so we it's not every single day. Yeah. Um, just on the busier of our days. And if we find out that we need to go further, we can. But with the hours from 3 p.m. in the afternoon and um, the ability to go outside to ceases at 10 p.m. with the area needing to be free from alcohol at 11 p.m. and run this um, provision through November 1st of 2020. I'll second it. All right. S Sue, Jennifer, did you guys get that? The no one the alcohol being served into that area stop would stop at ten PM with the area need to be cleaned up and vacated by eleven. Erm, uh, did you have anything on that? No. What do you, what part do you need, Tim? Yeah, I think uh, based on uh, what you've drafted for number eight. So just for clarification, item seven, um, no action was taken then? That would be correct. Got her, Tim? All right. And then just for clarification, Mr. Chairperson, you're making a motion to approve the presented ordinance by the city attorney and including more language with the, the time. Just so we have some established times. Yeah. yeah. Correct. But the rest of it, you're, you're liking the rest of the ordinance that was presented. Yes. Okay. Um, and, and Lee, you're okay with this as a starting point?
thank you. Oh, thank you, Lee. Um, any, we have a motion and second on the floor. Is there any other further discussion? Carrying none, committee will vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Ayes have it. And uh, Lee, this item isn't officially approved yet. It'll have to go to the full council in, in two weeks and be d discussed by a body. Um, item seven, we disposed of it, led into item eight. So we'll move on to item number nine, which is consider a request from Alderperson Koth to further geo-restrict the pool to city residents and municipalities that have officially partnered with the city should a significant number of city residents be turned away with the current limit of 400. I'll just, uh, my referral, I'll, I'll start on that. We, two weeks ago, voted to open up the pool. And I know there's some problems with the geo restrictions that have been put on it, but um, my first and foremost responsibility is to the taxpayers of the city of Wisconsin Rapids that have built that pool and are going to be paying for it for the next 20 years. Um, because of the recommendations that we've had to use because of COVID-19, my concern is, is even though we geo-restrict the area, should the pool experience such volumes of people that we're now churning away city residents? And I believe we're, um, I was at the pool yesterday and they're, they're doing what Joe said they were gonna do. They're, they're checking where people live when they come in. So I do believe that they would further have the capability to see how many people from within the city boundaries were churning away. And I believe if we're churning away a significant number of city residents, then we need to make sure that we are putting city of Wisconsin Rapids residents to the front of the line to get a chance to use the facility that they built. Go ahead, Mayor. I stopped by there today and it was another very busy day. Um, I actually saw that uh, they did reach capacity today and as people left they would let additional people in. So, but, and I'll be curious to see in the next week or so what that uh, ratio of residents and non-residents are once we kind of get into a little bit further. But it was at capacity today before the storm hit. Go ahead, Scott. <clears throat> Seems like this is something, I agree with what you're saying, but it's something that we could visit as a council in two weeks when Joe has data as to how many were turned away, et cetera, what you're saying, Mayor, um, and just uh, keep it on the agenda to the, to the, for a discussion at the Common Council. Because I agree, I mean, <clears throat> you have to pay to play. I mean, if people aren't, um, and other cities aren't helping us with regard to the building of the project, then maybe they shouldn't be part of it or uh, increase the fees for uh, residents in those areas. I mean, that's just the way it is. Our, our residents are paying for it and paying to come in. So um, I think it's something to, to consider as a discussion when we have more data and th we have a three weeks period of time of data that we can entertain some ideas. So something to think about. Tom, do you have anything? Alderperson Kubitschek. So just so we can uh, move this on to the full council, I, do we need a motion, Sue? Because I think I got one that I can make. Okay, I'll make a motion to uh, send item number nine uh, for consideration by the full common council at the next regular meeting in two weeks after um, we have some more data to see how many residents are being turned away from the pool. We have a motion and second. Is there any other further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Uh, number 10 is an update on the COVID-19 business response grant. I uh, assume, Tim, we're going to go to you. Oh, Kyle, sorry. Uh, this was a request 
did, uh, again, this was requested, I believe, about a month ago. Just wanting to know what businesses received funds, in what amount, and so as part of the packet, I had included the, the list of all the applicants, um, tried to separate their grantee name and their business name, as well as the dollars that were granted to them, which totals uh, 62 applicants uh, at about $79,500. And there were about 19 applicants that did not get funding for one reason or another. And uh, so we, we do have uh, about $20,000 left that was earmarked for this. Um, certainly you could advise you know, what, what to do with that. I think um, you know, in, after we provided this grant was when the WEDC stepped up and allowed for the $2,500 grants to 30,000 businesses across the state. And I think that is somewhat met uh, the gap that small business owners still had, uh, perhaps after receiving the city grant. So, you know, I don't necessarily think there's a, a huge need to, to find a use for that remaining $20,000, um, but certainly if, if the body advised in doing so, we can try to put something together. So you want to have any questions for Kyle? No, thanks for compiling this. I appreciate it. Yeah, and I, like I've said before, it couldn't have been done without the Chamber's assistance. Um, so I, I really want to thank Angel and Krista for their work at the Chamber. Thank you, Kyle. Oh, Mayor? And also further, I want to thank uh, Sue, Kyle, and Tim, because they all put quite a bit of time into this. Thank you, Mayor. Um, item number 11 is an update on the wayfinding sign de uh, design project. Uh, is that yours as well, Kyle? The reason I had asked to bring this before the committee uh, is because Corbin, the design consultant, is in the final stages of creating uh, an estimate and putting some cost to um, these signs. and. I want to make sure that before they do that and do the final work needed for the design that the commission and the council um, you know, like the, the final design that's been proposed or offer the council and this body uh, an opportunity to ask questions if you wanted to see the other designs that were reviewed. But essentially, we've had an internal com committee uh, of staff members and then we've had a much larger group that I believe included Alder, Alderman Rayom. And we've asked for their comment along the way and their direction and ultimately what's been included in the packet is the final design that uh, is really <clears throat> a hybrid approach to a more rustic and a more urban. We kind of intertwined the two and included some wood elements and some metal elements with, within the signs, which I think um, you know, is, is very appealing and will do well throughout uh, several areas of the city. Does anyone have any questions for Kyle? And again, we don't need action, but certainly if you do have comments, questions, feel free to contact our office. Um, and then uh, my hope is to give Corbin, the consultant, the okay to go ahead and finalize this design and then wrap up the project in the next month or two. Thank you. Um, item number 12 is discussion regarding financing for the University Year Program. Mayor? I think Kyle can probably, sorry, you might be able to help me if I need a little help here. Um, in, in your packet, you will see a timeline which goes back to August 19th of 2019 um, when, a, when a project, or I don't know if it was a project, or proposals were submitted by the city to University Year Program, and it's through UW-Madison, and there's some literature also attached and uh, so then groups were put together and they they formulated a, a group of projects and there are eight projects um, and e each project has community members assigned to it uh, and they're paired with if correct me if I'm wrong Kyle a graduate program whether it be through or graduate students through UW-Madison and other another university and so 
So they're starting to work on these projects. They, they were in limbo a little bit because of COVID and schooling. My concern came when we received a $25,000 bill, an invoice for it, and that hadn't been budgeted or been approved or gone through council. So we have to figure out you know, where and how we're gonna pay for that. And then also, I spoke with the, the project lead person and I asked them if we decided to part ways at this point and, or if council chose to not to pursue it. We are into it, I believe, for about $10,000 as for the work that has been performed up to this point. Scott, go ahead. Um, I really think it's a great idea, but I do have some concerns. Um, about two years ago, I was interested in art in a park that I pushed, and the, the Arts Council had something else where they were pushing uh, with the mayor with regard to renting statues or what have you for the parks, and we are talking past each other. So I kind of just gave up on what I was talking about. Basically, I'll tell you what I was talking about, uh, which I think fits into this. We have parts of our park that I, the reason I came up with the idea, I was on public works, and there's areas in our city that takes quite a bit of labor, uh, cutting of hills uh, and so forth, and there's some areas in our parks that are really not attractive. For example, in Demons Park, here's a, a water pump building, and we just did the park and the, and the, and the building's still there. Could that, could something, a mural be in front of that? Um, I also, in, in my discussion, talked about Demis Park could be a park dealing with cultural, um, different uh, ethnic groups. You could have um, the Firemen's Park dealing with uh, first responders. Uh, you could have Veterans Park, naturally, with the veterans and, and north, uh, the northern park, uh, Mead View Park music and so forth. But um, there's a lot of really attractive things at one of the parks that I visited, and they had a cultural, oops, sorry, they had a cultural area, area of this, you know, in the center of the park. But the concerns I have with this proposal is, um, for example, um, in project two, it says, the Arts Advisory Board, who, who will make up for the Arts Advisory Board? Who does the Art Advisory Board to, um, report to? Um, I know the Beautification Council a couple years ago talked about um, a wildflower area for butterflies, and then all of a sudden, as, as aldermen, we had calls with regard to it, and then they never came through the Common Council. So, I mean, when you the idea, too, that you develop a arts advisory board and then our decisions made, and by the time it comes to the Common Council, can we get a preliminary idea? So when it comes to the Common Council, we're not the bad guys as to, no, we're not going to, and, and, and we're, we will do it. Um, so that was one concern I had. Um, who will pay for it? Who will pay for the maintenance of it? I think that should be part of the guidelines. Who'll pay for it? Who'll be paying for the maintenance of it? Uh, is it built uh, to be able to be maintained well um, without a lot of city funds and so forth? That it's like you build it, then who's going to maintain it? And then all of a sudden, we have to have more employees maintain it. Or, or can we, for example, take sites, like I said, a hill. We have the hill in Demets Park. I saw a beautiful, I mentioned this to the previous Common Council, but in one of the areas I saw a beautiful eagle and the wood was pushed in, different color wood into the hill and you could see an eagle there. Now, that hill doesn't have to be mowed. <laughs> or you could use different type colored gravel and now that hill doesn't have to be mowed. So some of the guidelines I'd like to see if it could take care of the areas and would pay for itself somewhat. And I think that should be considered. Um, and basically, that's what I was concerned about. Just the idea of an advisory board, um, 
how far along do they go before the Common Council sees their plans so that we can say yes or no before it goes further and then who's going to pay for the projects? All that, all those guidelines I'd like to see nailed down or this could be a, <laughs> a major initiative costing the city more than we think we would want right now. Or if it's staged and comes in in different stages, a park at a time, maybe it's less of an issue. But um, when I read it, I started taking notes, and those are the concerns I had. But I like the concept of art in the park. Thank you, Scott. Um, Mayor, I had Kyle raise his hand quick before you. Did do you have something, Kyle? Yeah, I thought I'd provide a little bit more background. Um, I, like the mayor, don't have a ton of history in regards to this coming into this in March. I know a lot of the, the meetings previously to create the, I think there were initially six projects had already occurred. And, and from my knowledge, there was a lot of interest. There was a lot of excitement. Unfortunately, since I've been involved, what I've seen is that there's there's somewhat been a loss of interest, and I'm not sure if that's due to COVID or not, uh, just in terms of other community partners that you know, we've asked to kind of step up and take the lead to some of these because for city staff to, you know, operate and lead all these eight projects is going to be a, a ton of staff time, uh, especially because many of them touch upon the community development department. So what we've done since we've um, been involved or since I've been involved is, is we've tried to cater some of the projects to more of the current happenings within the community. For example, one of which that was recently added was a marketing and strategic um, plan for the aquatic center. So to work with a promotions class and a marketing class to look at the aquatic center and to basically, you know, provide a marketing campaign, you know, who's the target audience, um, you know, and a strategy that maybe we could implement in a full season next year. And they could look at this year uh, and, and how we're operating in this kind of, this unique circumstance and then, um, you know, how we can tweak things to you know accommodate a full year next year. The other thing I wanted to note is uh, I just talked to uh, Gavin and in working with Joe Eichstead to try to uh, th there's a, a university class that is looking or has experience in in flooding and mitigation and we're doing the flooding study and we're expecting results from that study to be finalized shortly. So could the class uh, look at putting together a uh, uh, an, an action uh, or, or response guide to a flooding event that could be implemented across the entirety of the city. So I think those things are, are, are more measurable uh, outcomes in investing the dollars for this program, things that we can utilize in the near future versus you know an arts collaborative that might have more implications and more funding moving forward, which I still think is a great project, uh, but I think the outcome for a project like that is more of, you know, here's the strategy and here's the partners that need to be involved and here's the funding sources and then it's up to the city or somebody then to uh, to carry out that implementation strategy. So, so the measurable might not be there uh, and, and from an investment standpoint, you know, you'd have that strategy but you'd still have partners required to, to implement that strategy. The other the other project that might not be included is uh, is marketing the downtown. Uh, so I had recently talked to the, the primary contact with the program and uh, they've got another marketing promotion class that's looking to put together a strategy for marketing downtown on multiple platforms, social media, uh, maybe even creating a separate website. And I think that, again, from a measurable standpoint is very crucial now coming out of this pandemic and, you know, coming out of the improvements to the downtown parks. You know, I think we were well positioned to push and market downtown, especially with the investment we've seen and potential future investment with the Triangle Project and East Town Plaza, uh, I think is, is another great project that could come out of this. So I would continue and strongly advocate for funding this. Um, again, where that funding comes from, I can't necessarily provide a recommendation, but certainly we are, we are continuing to, to try to tweak some of these projects so that they do have uh, outcomes and measurables in the near future. Thank you, Kyle. Mayor Blazer. 
Thank you, Kyle, for a further update. And I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room a little bit here. You know, this was, this, it says proposals were submitted back in August 19th of 2019. At no time did we receive any information on funding it, whether or not we should submit proposals. It never came before finance requesting that we submit this proposal. Um, we have $25,000 of taxpayer money being committed to a project that this is really the first time council's talking about it. And here we sit, we have a $25,000 bill that isn't designated how we're going to pay for it, where we're going to get the money from, and, and that's my biggest concern in it. It should never happen that from August 19th till now. And that's my concern. And well, now we have to figure out if we want to pay for services rendered or pay for to continue on the project. Um, like Kyle said, though, we are committing staff time and could be considerable amount of staff time should local partners choose not to participate fully in this. And uh, so that it, if we're going to step up and, and commit the $25,000 and a three years to do this, then we're also committing staff time and considerable amount of staff time should it need to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Blazer. So you want to have any questions for Kyle or Shane at this, or Kyle or, Th I'm sorry, does anyone have any questions for Kyle or Shane? Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, I don't know if it's an elephant in the room type of thing, but I think that this is a perfect example of us having the cart in front of the horse. And this is prior to me receiving the agenda. I had no idea what this thing was. Uh, university year program. I know when I was in my master's degree program of public administration with the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, our program would go through and the program director, our thesis professor Carl Nolenberger, would choose six or eight different projects from different municipalities that would submit uh, a project request. And we would go through either a cost benefit analysis of buying a, a boom truck or go through a, a, a maybe a comprehensive outdoor recreational plan scope or something something like that, and it didn't cost the city a dime. Our services were provided uh, for the benefit of us doing the projects and learning how to do that as students. So I don't even understand what this program is. Um, it, it does sound like it's a profit generating program. I've never heard of it, but again, I've never heard of it also on the standpoint that I'm on the city council and we've got to appropriate funds, especially $25,000 funds that weren't necessarily allocated for anything. Who made the decision to do this? Who signed the ticket? I mean, where's the checks and balances here? Um, this is inappropriate, first of all. Secondly, it might even be illegal. So as far as I'm concerned, whatever we've paid, I guess we're, whatever uh, services were rendered, I guess we're on the hook for that, but I'm not in favor of anything further unless we sit down and actually specifically talk about this, where are the funds coming from, where are they going, and what we're going to do with this. Thank you all, person. Could we check anyone else? Um, on the agenda that this is a discussion item only um, for financing this university year program. Um, so I think, uh, my opinion, I think we need to bring this back next month with uh, some more information. Hopefully by then a lot of these questions of where this come from, how it got authorized can be answered. And then, um, I know Kyle from staff just encouraged on keeping it. Um, I, go ahead, Kyle. Again, from a history standpoint, I can't specifically provide information on its inception and you know the the process last fall to now. Um, I personally see value in the program. Um, we are currently uh, working with a, what would be two classes, summer courses, very intense eight-week courses. One is for the strategic marketing plan for the Aquatic Center. The other is for a kind of the promotion for downtown and the parks. And those are probably going to be continued incurred costs, uh, and they started, I believe, two weeks ago. So. You know, we need to 
it'd be great to have direction because with those courses underway, it might not be too late to have the faculty responsible for those courses to change direction of the course with you know being in the second week or third week now of the course. And um, if we continue, you know, the longer we continue, I think the more dollars we would incur. I think it was $5,000, I believe, per project, I think might be the, the cost associated. And so the thought was, you know, if we have a, a group of several projects, right, we, that we would meet that $25,000 threshold. And I think the thought also is, I'm guessing that the University of Madison recognizes that there's an interest from several communities across the state to have those communities partner with different students, whether it's internships or um, graduate programs. And I think they recognized that there was competition. And I think they wanted to create a fair playing, uh, you know, uh, field where everyone who has interest can, you know, participate and, and utilize the university services. And I think this is the, the program they com came up with, which, you know, unfortunately for communities like us, there is a, you know, uh, a cost to be part of that program. And at some point or the other, I think the previous administration recognized that they wanted to participate in that program, engaged in participating in that program, and we're at where we're we at. We are at where we're at today because of that. I oh, wanted to speak here first, I'll get to you, Mayor. I understand what you're saying, Kyle, and I appreciate what you're saying, and it kind of goes along a lot with what Scott's saying, um, too, that there's there's value in this program. It brings something to the community. Um, my concern at this point in time is, number one, this is a program we don't have a funding source for. And um, you know, out of a $57 million budget, $25,000 might seem like a small portion when you hold it up next to $57 million, but it's still a considerable amount of money. And just as at the last council meeting, uh, Alderperson Kellogg had asked for uh, $109,000 to be allocated to a library project, and I, I voted against it because in 24 days, we don't know the future of the mill in, in this town, which is our biggest taxpayer. And if that does shut down, that's going to have um, very negative impacts for this community. And you know, I just, I believe in investing in Wisconsin Rapids. I want our city to stand out amongst other cities, but I also want to make sure that we're doing it responsibly and doing it the right way and that we, for what we're funding, we can af afford to fund it. Um, you know, not, uh, not know where the money's going to come from. I understand what you're saying too about giving staff direction uh, at the, the school so they know which way to go and you know, the whole time is money thing and everyone needs to make a decision but um, I just I have some reservations about approving something when we have two kind of big question marks of funding source and not knowing what's happening with the town's biggest employer um, at that I'll go to Mayor Blazer yeah I just kind of kind of piggyback off what Kyle was saying is that you know, there's, you know, we're already getting, unfortunately, into projects with uh, students. So this is part of their class. So we're kind of painted into a corner on that. And then, yeah, none of us have ever heard anything about this. Those of us that have been on the council previously, this is all pretty much news to us. And so I think realistically the committee needs to decide if, if we're going to sever ties and pay what we're due or commit to the project and find a funding source I guess. Now, I don't like it any better you know who, none of us got a chance to debate this at the front side of the project we're stuck here quarter way into the into the process but and we still have another couple of years to go until the, the completion. Uh, but it's it's still $25,000 of taxpayer money that was, did not go through a process for approval. 
and I think the longer we wait, obviously we're incurring more expense uh, and then the commitment of the students into the projects. If we would stop and sever ties, then what happens to that? And I know it's not our concern, but it is our concern because we've been put into the situation and none of us had a decision in that. Thank you. Tom, you have anything? <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> um, we're on the hook for 10000 They thought up to okay. about that much. Is that, is that including, Kyle, the, I think you mentioned two classes that are taking place right now? Is that part of that 10000 or do you know now off the top of your head? <laughs> I don't think it is. I think the mayor may have communicated with uh, the lead on the, the project prior to finalizing and starting these last two class projects. Would we have any idea what it is to finish these two classes or, I mean, if they're we could, Yeah, we could probably certainly get numbers on mm -hmm. the completion of these eight week, these two eight week it, courses. It, it, which and it, it's going, going on currently, time. correct? Yes, they, they so, started uh, two weeks ago, I believe. So, I mean, we either have them con continue if we wait till next month for the committee to act, and then to the middle of August for the council to act, that the eight weeks is going to be almost, gone. Right. So it's to basically, so for some of that, there should be a decision, I think, tonight by the council, or the committee, uh, which is still going to be another two weeks to go to the council. Or, you know, if somebody, if we want to stop it, maybe we can tell them wait right if, if, you know with regards to the direction if if the body wanted you know me to contact them immediately tonight or tomorrow and say hang on we've we've gotten further direction from our our legislated legislative bodies you know I would I would see what we can do to redirect the course to find another project for them with another community and hopefully just back entirely away from it Dean? So, so, so um, I think I think we should. Oh, no, just a second. I think Sorry. somehow the committee sh should get some type of direction. I think the staff on what on what to do because otherwise, if we, as I said earlier, if we just put it off till the next month's meeting, which can be, we're gonna we'll get through the two week uh, two uh, classes. Eight week classes will basically be done by the time the August council meeting come around. So. And that would add to the 10,000 or however it be, whatever much it be, uh, you know. <clears throat> and I, I guess that's up to the committee on where we, what we could, what you could do tonight. Thank you, Tom. Dean, go ahead. Um, yeah, well, it seems that we really don't know exactly what this program is. As, a, as we said, we really haven't been involved in the beginning of it or the funding of it. But one of the things that never brought up is we don't, and I feel bad if we do cut ties to the students of Madison that are working on this project, but it would seem to me, especially as Steve mentioned, with we don't know what's going to happen with our economy in this town and at the end of this month in the mill, it would seem if we are using outside educational sources to, do, to help us with our marketing, we might consider doing it at maybe Mid-State or even UD, UWSP, something a little closer rather than sending the money to Madison and not paying attention not keeping a good control over where it was in the first place. That's my thoughts. Mayor? I did ask why, because if it's a three-year program, why are we up to 10,000 already? And in, in the timeline, you'll see they, they were up here. They came up here. There was apparently community meeti meetings. Um, and so that's why it was a little more labor-intensive on the front end, and that's why you know, almost a third of the project cost has already been incurred. I just wanted to give you that little update on why it's so much of it right away. Scott? Well, whenever this was developed, it was a different time. I mean, you didn't have COVID-19, you didn't have the mill and other issues. I mean, so maybe discussions would be different now if the time was the same. We've also in the city used, um, going back to what Dean mentioned, uh, Stevens Point students in uh, reviewing 
our city and coming up with proposals and so forth and uh, working with local universities or mid-state uh, college, et cetera, would be advantageous. But the time is different now than it was when whomever, however, this was determined. And to go further, um, I think you're better off, in my opinion, cut our losses. Um, and it, since the courses have not um, spent too much time yet, they have eight weeks, it's just the beginning. They could look to other cities who maybe gave proposals and maybe feel more interested in what they, their help. So um, that's just my, my thinking on it. I, I think cut your losses and just that's the way it would be. That's where I'm coming from. And Kyle, if we cut our losses tonight, this is something should the city come out and on the other end of the mill find out that we're fine and things, we find a funding source for this project, this is something we can re-engage in later, whether it's with UW-Madison or SP or Mid-State? So yes, uh, I think, you know, being in point for eight years, I have very good relationships with several faculty in Stevens Point. And being over in point during that time, that was something that, I mean, we, we improved our relationship with the university because, because we recognize the value that their students can provide. And I know uh, previously the city with regards to the 8th Street um, concepts has, has also engaged with the university. So we can, we can continue to do that. Um, again, you know, uh, it, it would sadden me greatly if we cut ties with regards to the two projects where we have underway now. I think one of them is of huge benefit, and that's with regards to the Aquatic Center. I mean, with without a, a PR strategy or a marketing strategy, um, especially for next year, uh, I think, you know, that that's going to significantly assist with the success of the Aquatic Center, um, especially if we're not in a pandemic next year and we can advertise to the surrounding communities regionally and, and have that strategy, uh, you know, come next spring when the Aquatic Center is opening. Um, and maybe Joe can speak to a little bit more about that. Uh, and you know, just in, in, in regards to downtown generally also, I think there's, there's huge value in, in being able to, to promote what we have in downtown and our parks and our recreational opportunities and our business opportunities and our redevelopment opportunities and the housing opportunities. But certainly again, I understand and, and personally, I, I agree that this, this should have been something that should have came before you guys before it was earmarked and before it got to this point. And so I'm, I'm, I'm put in a pretty tough situation where I'm excited about the opportunity, but I also recognize the difficulty and the decisions that have been made up to this point. So certainly I will, I will take whatever direction you provide, whether that's cutting ties as soon as possible uh, or getting more information as soon as possible and maybe scheduling a special meeting or working with, with Tim to try to find alternative sources of funding. Um, but certainly I, I also recognize there's a ton of value here in the projects we have lined up over the next couple of years. Thank you, Kyle. Um, Tim, did you? Deciding if I want to speak or not. Um, I think really one of the key issues for me here is that we're looking at approving funding for a project outside the budget process. The reason we have a budget process is so we get all, everyone's budget recommendations, requests and priorities, and we evaluate them at one point in time. To evaluate projects like this outside that process, I think is unfair a little bit because in a vacuum, a lot of things look really good and you'd want to fund it. But when you put it against other priorities, other departments, other initiatives, maybe it doesn't carry as much weight. And that's why you have a budget process. And I think sometimes we get a little loose with approving stuff outside the budget process and we need to put a little more credence in really getting those requests in the budget, making informed decisions and going forward. Obviously things are gonna come up that you can't anticipate. That's why we have budget amendments. But my main concern here is, is that we're evaluating something when maybe something was taken out of the budget that might have been actually more important compared to this. And so I really think we have to think about, you know, yes, are these good projects? Yeah, but really realistic right now, we're incurring expenditures that we have no legal appropriation for. 
and I think it just I I think we need to respect the budget process. I don't know if we can just postpone these projects, put it into the 2021 budget, but obviously the budget coming up is going to be could be a, a significant challenge for us, and you know and stuff like this. Is it going to be like well? we need to go forward with things like this, or are these are the things that maybe we're not going to be able to afford anymore. But to, you know, to really look at this outside the budget process, I think is kind of disrespectful to the budget as a whole. Thank you, Tim. Um, with everything that's been said, um, first off, I'm going to, per our city attorney, all motions need to be made in a positive manner. So I will make the motion on this in the positive manner, but then I will I'm going to use my negative vote and then Kyle, just so you know that this will go to council then on the 21st or it might be discussed again. But um, on item number 12, I will make a motion to approve funding for the university year program. I'll second it. We have motion and a second on the floor. Is there any other further discussion? I think with regard to one topic was we mentioned marketing, the aquatic center, and so forth. To, to a large extent, I think it's going to be marketing itself. But um, we do have the Convention of Visitors Bureau who, who may give some advice or get engaged with some of the things that they do to help market the aquatic center or other aspects of our city. So I think they might be a good resource that we already have in the city. So I'm, I'll be voting. That's what comment I want to make, so I'll vote no. Thank you, Alderperson Kellogg. Tim? <laughs> I just, just, I guess I'm on my soapbox tonight. Um, you know, when we sit there and say we approve funding, well, what is the source of the funding? What budget account is that coming out of? I mean, I think, I think that's something we also have to improve on is, is that when we approve funding, it's like, no, we need to identify exactly the source of the funds, the budget account that are going to fund these programs when we approve any of these programs. And I, and I don't want to say I'm not taking away from University and what it provides and, you know, it, it's just, for me, it's more of a procedure and formality and um, that is one of the reasons why I'll probably be bringing forth the next couple of months is a, a formal budget policy that's going to address and put some controls on these types of items so that we're going through the proper procedure that, that the funds are being um, accounted for and that when you have a motion like when you have an item like this for discussion that you have a budget, re budget resolution that if it's approved that's the next item that you're actually approving and amending the budget to fund that as opposed to doing it after the fact. I got you so um, to identify a funding source for, just for the motion's sake right um, and I know what you I know what you're saying, Tim. You do you want uh, funding put in into the motion or? Uh, and my my guess is that um, my guess is that you know if if you if you were looking at one of the projects is the marketing of the aquatics, it would probably come to the aquatics budget because if we were to hire a firm to market the aquatic center, that's the budget we come out of, but obviously, you know, we would get that approved first. Um, but so I would say for that one, I mean, I guess I don't know how far they're into this, how much, how much expenditures we have, but I would say that the, the aquatics budget would fund that one program, and what is the other one? The downtown? Downtown, Down, downtown marketing, I believe you said. That you could probably, Assuming we would probably, depending on if room tax, I mean, obviously room tax has taken a hit uh, this year. Um, uh, that could be a possible funding source. Um, I, but I guess, you know, the problem is I don't know what the amounts of those programs exactly are. Go ahead, Kyle. I think if, if you want me to try to investigate on what it would cost to continue the two that are currently underway with those potential revenue streams. I could probably do that relatively quickly. Um, and then if you wanted to cut ties with the other programs, um, because I, you know, right now I don't know if, you know, that's going to ruin the, the intensive eight week course by cutting ties two weeks in. 
Um, you know, I, I talked to the students regarding the downtown one last week and provided input and provided a ton of materials already. So, um, you know, I, I, I'd hate to leave them hanging and, and to have the course, you know, essentially stall. Um, but if, if it's more information that's needed, it's certainly something I could get rel relatively quickly for the two that are underway now. Just hold, hang out up there and acknowledge Tim. Uh, at a minimum, what I'd like to see is that maybe we could schedule a meeting uh, the Monday before council, and that way we could have the cost of the two programs, have a budget resolution, and then that way the council has a little bit more information to make a decision on at the Tuesday council. Or we can get it next week sometime, depending on when you're able to obtain the information, but that would be my recommendation so that we're actually, one, approving the program, the cost of the program and identify the specific funding source. Mayor. And we'll also have to consider a funding source for time spent up to this point on the other projects. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to point out the obvious. Tim, I don't want to make this uh, more difficult than it needs to be. Um, I understand everything that was said here and, and the importance of what was said about respecting the budget process and, and not going around that and, and finding funding sources for this. Um, I just don't want to set a precedence here by circumventing the, the budget process and then we find ourselves in a similar situation down the road. Um, I would uh, amend my motion, I'll do that here in a moment, to, to include the two budget accounts that you suggested, but I still feel like the right thing to do is to vote against this um, because we don't have a funding source, source for it. We don't know the future of uh, the mill at this point in time. There's just too many question marks and as Kyle said, when I asked him the question, this is something when it goes through the proper channel, we can come back and do later, whether it's through Mid-State Technical College or Stevens Point University or even Madison again, but um, you know, Thad's uh, said it numbers of times about um, following the established procedures and guidelines that we have to go by and, and doing what we need to do. And that's what I feel we need to do in this situation. I feel at this point, cutting the tie is the right thing to do until we go through and do it the right way. Um, so on that, I will amend my motion and I will have my motion to fund the univers university year Thank program uh, with funding for the aquatics project from the aquatic budget and for the downtown marketing from the room tax budget. Um, Scott, would you still hold your second on that? I'll second. All right. Tim? Speaking way too much time. You also have the existing funds of the approximately 10000 that I, I guess we need to address that because we've already incurred those and that would probably come from contingency. All right, I'll make a separate motion on that then after this motion. Um, we have a motion and second on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Uh, this, uh, I, I don't want to say that I don't have empathy for the, the students involved in this program, but this could be a great case study for them in terms of potential misappropriation of funds with the local government. So that's one thing that they could kind of look into this. Any further discussion on this item? Hearing none, um, just as the city attorney would remind you, uh, a vote in the affirmative is to approve funding for these projects. A vote in the negative is to not approve any further funding for the project at this point in time. Uh, just as a point of clarification. Um, hearing no further discussion, committee will vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 
All opposed signify by saying nay. 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 Uh, motion fails. Uh, zero ayes, three nays. Um, the next item on this university program is to pay for the costs that we have occurred. And on that, I will make a motion to pay uh, the university program um, for the amount of, do you have an exact amount or? He said approximately 10,000. Okay. Anywhere from five to 10,000, but we'd have to find that out. All right. I will make, an, I will make a motion to approve the funds due to University City contingent on an itemized list being presented to the full common council in an amount at this time not to exceed ten thousand dollars i'll second it we have a motion and second on the floor is there any other further discussion on this item scott well since they're spending ten thousand dollars close to it i'd like to see what material they have i mean if they've had sessions here and they had workshops and presented things, they have information that they accumulated as a result, and I would like to have that information because at some point in time it might be advantageous. We're spending $10,000. It'd be nice to see um, what have they accumulated so far that we could take advantage of. I don't know. I got the mayor, and then I'll get to you that. Mayor Blazer? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we can double check, but I think it was all brainstorming work, oh. <laughs> kind of community meeting, brainstorming type thing. There's not, this is now the point where a work product would be produced. All right. That. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. And to, to piggyback on that, Mr. Kellogg, we don't have a copy of the contract. It could be one of these where if we don't deliver the full $25,000, their intellectual property is not accessible to us. You know, and that happens not frequently, but it happens. So they could say, you know, you guys are out, you know? Yeah. Tim, I thought I saw your hand go up down there. Okay. Did I identify the funding source in that motion or did you need that? If I didn't say contingency, I meant to put that in there. Scott, would you still hold the second? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, so this motion, again, would be to pay the money due um, with them to provide an itemized amount to the council two weeks from now and not to exceed the $10,000. So um, all in favor of paying for the work that's been done, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Um, item number 13, consider for approval a Wisconsin Department of Administration Routes to Recovery grant. Uh, Tim? Okay. Um, uh, as part of the CARES Act, run over coronavirus relief fund the state of Wisconsin received approximately 210 million dollars from the, from the federal government um, and uh, the department Wisconsin Department of Administration allocated those funds to each municipality on a prorated basis based on population so the city's allocation was three hundred four thousand one hundred forty six dollars um, these funds can be used uh, for uh, a, a, a number of classifications as far as dealing with the COVID-19. Um, based on our grant management policy, I'm bringing you this forth, forth to the council for approval because any uh, grant in excess of $25,000 has to be technically approved by the city council and considering that these are federal funds and are subject to um, single audit, I um, want to make sure that we're following our policy and that um, all the guidelines according to that policy are followed. Um, basically, we have until November 1st to submit um, eligible expenditures um, to a portal that the state of Wisconsin. So as uh, I accumulate those costs, that eligible grant costs, uh, we'll be submitting those and getting reimbursement. Um, any allocation that we don't use will be returned back to the state and they'll, re they'll use that last month of 2020 to reallocate it to uh, other needs in the state. So just, this is just the formality of approving and accepting acceptance of the funds. And then um, I'll 
provide updates to the council on the use of those funds. Thank you, Tim. Um, I will make a motion to accept. Second. I was going to throw the amount on there too. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll make a motion to accept the grant um, in the amount of three hundred four thousand one hundred forty-six thousand dollars. We have a motion and second on the floor. Is there any other further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Item number 14 is considered for approval budget resolution number two. Tim? Sure. Um, this is uh, when the original budget was adopted uh, last fall, November 19th, um, at that point, all the, all the budgets were uh, basically determined based on 2019 uh, wage rates because at that time, um, the non-union wage rate, any wage increase was not approved at that time. And also, we, the two uh, union contracts, that being the police department, uh, WRPPA and local 425 firefighters, um, had not settled their contracts. So their, their budgets are actually reflected 2018 wage rates. Now that um, all those contracts have been settled um, and approved and the non-union uh, 2020 wage increase has been approved, basically this is just transferring the money that I budgeted in the contingency account uh, for um, the wage, wage increase and allocating it to the various departments to reflect the, the new wage rates. And uh, the reason why the police and fire department is uh, so much larger is because you're actually accounting for not only the 2019 wage rate, but also the 2020 wage rate. So it has a compounding effect. So that's why those amounts are a little bit larger than in comparison to the other departments. All right. Thank you, Tim. I'll make a motion to accept budget re resolution number two has presented. Second. We have a motion and second on the floor. Is there any other further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Um, item number 15 is audit of the bills. Uh, did everyone have a chance to look over that in their email and packet? Okay. I will make a motion to uh, accept the bills with check numbers from 4102 to 4531. I'll second it. We have a motion and second. Is there any other further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. Um, item number 16 is to set our next regular meeting date. And just pulling up the calendar here. Uh, first August in, uh, first Tuesday in August is the 4th. Uh, August 4th, 4.45 p.m. All right, our next regularly scheduled property and finance committee meeting will be August 4th at 4.45 p.m. And then our final item this evening is adjournment. I'll make a motion to adjourn at 6.48. Sorry. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, committee will vote. All in favor, aye. signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, ayes have it. We stand adjourned at 6.48. Uh, thank you everyone for being here and my apologies to the Public Works Committee for the length of time we ran on this.